Our next workshop presenter is the Reverend Dr. Darren Hernandez Mitchell. He earned a bachelor's from Bethune-Cookman in Florida, a master's of divinity from our school, Hood Theological Seminary, and his doctorate of ministry from Virginia Union Seminary. He has pastored a number of places across our Zion, including the Smithville Amy Zion Church on the Gerald Bennisville District that I had the privilege to serve and uh, now serves the Trinity Amy Zion Church, Greenboro, North Carolina. He's a liturgist, tremendous preacher, a lover of people, and a wonderful, wonderful friend of Zion. At this time, he will present the art of preaching, which is what he does best. Greetings to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to Bishop Crenshaw and Mrs. Crenshaw and to Miss Nicole Powell, Missionary Supervisor, Western Episcopal District, and to all the members of the Western Episcopal District and the Central Southern Africa Episcopal District. It's a joy to greet you. I am so honored and delighted to share in your Leadership Training Institute and I'm so thankful that the bishop has asked that I would share with you concerning preaching. Your bishop and I go back a good ways. He was my presiding elder uh, when I was in seminary, and we have been friends and brothers ever since. I was honored to chair his campaign for Episcopal honors, and God be thanked that the church elected him as a bishop in our church and we are indeed delighted that he is providing dynamic leadership, he and Mrs. Crenshaw. I want to begin with just a word of prayer. And I invite you to join me as we ponder in thanksgiving the fact that God has called us to this preaching ministry. In other words, I want you to just, in your own place, in your own space, thank God for making you a preacher and thank God for his continual development in your life as you continue to grow and become the preacher that God would have you to be for such a time as this. God, we are so thankful that you have called us to so great a ministry. You've called us to this noble and prophetic work. Thank you for the privilege that you've given us to share together in this exchange and this conversation. I pray for your holy presence to surround us, to engulf us, to impart wisdom and understanding and guidance that we might, oh God, bring you glory through our lives, through our living, and through our preaching. Thank you for calling us into the preaching ministry. And thank you for your continual development in our lives. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, make this time meaningful in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin this conversation, and I trust and pray that it will be a conversation. Just to talk about preaching, I want to offer a definition for preaching, and before I go any further, I want to thank my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, who is also a preacher. And he is also our production engineer here at Trinity Church. Thank my beloved son, Caleb Kennedy Mitchell, for what he is providing for this space for us. I am so honored and delighted to be able to bring this to you. And the fact that he is able to do it is an extreme joy and privilege for me. Let me just share that our goal is to present and discuss models for effectively developing sermons that will facilitate growth for both preacher and church. And to identify and share tips on effective sermon preparation and delivery from conception to delivery as we minister to the people of God. Now, I operate under some 
very fundamental convictions. And there are at least four fundamental convictions that I operate under. And these four fundamental convictions uh, come from my own personal reflection, but I've also been influenced by the thought and theology of Dr. Samuel D. Witt Proctor. Dr. Samuel D. Witt Proctor was president of North Carolina A&T State University, but he was also president of the Virginia Union University, and he was also professor at Rutgers University and pastor of the famed and historic Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, New York. Dr. Proctor is considered one of this country's great omniticians. He is now gone upstairs to be with the ancestors. Dr. Proctor was indeed an influence to many preachers and continues to influence from the grave preachers who continue to work hard at being effective in the ministry of proclamation. He contends, and I affirm, that the preacher must first be a person of faith. If the preacher is not believable, the message is noisy musings from a frustrated actor. The preacher must be a person of faith. That when you stand in the square acre, you must have the conviction that you believe the gospel that you preach. Now, you may not be the gospel, but you must believe the gospel so that in, in believing the gospel, the preachment that comes from you is not only a blessing to those that listen to you, but it's also a blessing to your life. So the preacher must be a person of faith. Faith makes us believable. Secondly, the preacher must be a person of passion, pathos, pathos. Passion is what makes us persuasive. Such a passion often leaves one vulnerable to the ascriptions of excessive regard and dependence, while at the same time causes the preacher to rest upon emotional accoutrement rather than spiritual development. In other words, the preacher must have a passion for there is an urgency with which the preacher delivers the sermon. Precious souls are at our keeping. Preacher must have passion. I'm not merely talking about emotional appeal, but passion in the sense that what is being uttered from your lips comes from a passionate resolve to live and to live into what it is the gospel is calling us to become as we make our way through this wilderness road. So, you must have passion. Passion is what makes you persuasive. Passionate about the word of God. Passionate about people. It is said of Dr. Sandy Ray, who once pastored and was the great pastor of the Cornerstone Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York, where I served as a pastor uh, at the First Day of Zion Church in Brooklyn, New York. Dr. Ray was known for his great preaching. And someone asked his wife, Cynthia, what makes Sandy Ray such an effective preacher? And she answered them in this way, Sandy loved people. He had a passion for people. You can't preach unless you have a passion, yes, for the Word of God, and a passion for the people of God. You gotta have passion, you gotta have passion. Thirdly, the preacher must be a person of authority. This is what gives you the right to speak. The preacher is called to be a leader and such a calling is evidenced not only in the office or the boardroom, it is manifested in the ministry of the word. The preacher is to lead persons to a richer awareness of the presence of God at work in the community in which they are called. When you and I were ordained, if you have received the ordinations of our church, when the bishop ordained you and ordained me, the bishop said these words, take thou authority to preach, not to preside over meetings, not to be the provost, 
but primarily to preach. For it is through preaching that lives are shaped and shifted. It's through the preachment that you have the authority to preach. And the church has given you that authority and you cannot take it lightly and you cannot squander it on seeking to be the politician or the provost or any other position for which you believe that you have validity or that gives you an authority. No, the preacher must have authority. That you have the authority, that which exudes from you, that which is you, not someone else, but you. That as you preach, that which comes forth comes from a place that has been touched by the divine. That authority that is given to you is not merely something for you to wield as one in authority. No, as one in authority, you have been given authority from those who are in charge or those who have been given the authority to give to you the authority to preach and to minister to the people of God. So the preacher must be a person of authority. And then finally, the preacher must be a person of grace. Grace is what makes us listeners. We lean in. We listen. The work of grace in the preacher also makes the preacher gracious also. You can tell a person who is detached from their preacher because they're so busy pointing at you that they're not inviting you into a shared space of grace. Let me say that again. They're pointing at you. They're talking at you rather than inviting you into a shared space of grace where God is working on all of us. In other words, we're, we're all moving from identity to destiny and God is not through with any of us. God is at work in us. And the work that God is doing in us is indeed the work of grace. Now, there are five images, I believe, of the work of the preacher. This is just some preliminary uh, preparation for what we're going to get into as we start talking about preparation. But these, these building blocks, I believe, are theological and also pragmatic uh, foundations and pillars that I want to establish as we move into the how of preaching. But this is just basically a, a foundation for us to work for. So five images of the work of the preacher. The first, first image is one of a comfort dispenser. I want to stop the pain. I want to be the one that stops the pain. That's, that's one image. That there are those who think that my job, our job, is to stop the pain. I don't want to get on my soapbox, so I'm not going to delve into that. I just want to give these five images, and then we can chase them later in our presentation. Comfort dispenser. That's the one who says, I want to stop the pain. The second image is that of what I call a pedantic dilettante. Yeah. Uh, in other words... I want to show you how much I know. And I want to give you all these fanciful words so that when I'm done, you leave saying, ooh, he's a smart one. Or she's intelligent. A pedantic dilettante that I'm showing off who I am so that people can see me rather than the God in me. Let me keep, let me keep moving. The next image is that of a social prophet. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. That's the one who critiques, yes, the social location, the climate, the culture, the context, and they're always commentating on what they see. And so they chase after what's happening around them. And they're always commentating on what's happening around them, the social prophet. And then the fourth image is that of a, a Bible repository. 
This is the person that always moves about saying, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. And in Greek and in Hebrew, it means this. And, and in Aramaic, it means that. And the Septuagint says this. And the Latin Vulgate says that. They know everything. They know, as, as the King James Version says, they know every jot and tittle. They know every, every punctuation mark, where things move. And, and yet... They are a revival repository. They know, they know every nuance that has been created or nuance that has been established within the sacred text. Bible repository. They know a lot about the Bible. That's the fourth image. But the fifth image is the one that I want to wade into. The fifth image is that of a balanced preacher. This is the person that says, let's make the connection where we are and be faithful to every aspect as best we can. Will you be good at everything as a preacher? No. Will you be adept in every discipline as a preacher? No. But there are some things we're called to be faithful to. Faithful to the word of God. Faithful to the people of God. Sensitive to where people are. Sensitive to, to where people are located. Their social location. Understanding where people are struggling. Yes, being sensitive to it. But can you do it all effectively? No. I will say this. As a word of wisdom to us. There will be seasons where you are called to emphasize a particular area, a particular issue that requires you, yes, to do some serious investigation and study. But will you be good at every nuance and every discipline? No. But being faithful, being faithful to where your people are. Being faithful to what you're called to do in that moment. Being faithful to the disciplines of preaching is what you and I are called both to be and to do. And to also be sensitive to where we are in our faith journey as God continues to work with us. All right, let me share with you some basic considerations as we prepare the spoken word. And there are three of them. And I just want to hit them and then we'll keep moving. The first base, the first consideration as we prepare the spoken word is there must always be a sensitive awareness of the audience and its contextual situation. In other words, the ecology of the sermon, where people are. Your bishop likes this word. I've heard him use it quite often. The Zitzenleben, the life setting of the congregation. That you not only exegete the text, the biblical text, but you also exegete the context. That you don't lean on packaged or canned sermons or manufactured messages. Because God has a fresh word and what God wants from us is a ready mind and will to be open to what God wills to say to us. So there must be a sensitive awareness of the audience and its contextual situation. Where are the people? And that, my beloved brothers and sisters, requires us to, as Ezekiel says, sit where they sit. To not only sit silent before God, but to also sit as a listener, a priestly listener, to the hurts and pains of people. There's nothing worse, hear me good, there's nothing worse than being one that just simply spews out Sentiments and statements, make statements that flow from a place of arrogance and haughtiness. There's, there's nothing worse than a person that just simply speaks just to speak. Just saying something. There's a difference. I was taught as a child, there's a difference between saying something and then having something to say. And how that something comes from someone who holds us not only accountable for what we say, but holds us also responsible for nurturing our own spiritual lives. 
You have to nurture your spiritual life. Secondly, it is not only important to know where the audience is physically, socially, and psychologically, but it is good to know where they are theologically in their religious knowledge and understanding. You and I must know where the people are theologically and doctrinally. Where should the sermon begin? And what can be taken for granted? If you are a pastor of a congregation and you've been with the people, that, that's quite easy. It becomes easier over time to know where the people are doctrinally and theologically. All of it takes time. All of it takes time with people. And it also takes time with God. Thirdly, after learning who the people are and where they are, the next question is this. What should the word for them be on this day in this place? This word comes as a major proposition, a one-sentence statement that embraces a salient truth for that audience at that time. What is the word? What is God speaking in this day, on that day, for that day, for the people who are listening to you on that day? What is the word for God from God for the people of God on that particular day? What is needed? All of this, these, are, these basic considerations require time, understanding timing, spending time in devotion with God. One thing I believe that this pandemic has taught me as preacher is that a devotionless life will always be reflected in the pulpit. You can tell clearly those who have spent more time on YouTube than they did on their knees in devotion, reading God's word and letting God's word speak to them in such a way that when God's word speaks to them, they too recognize their need for God to do something mighty and powerful in their lives and to make changes where the change is necessary. All right? So now, now that we have the fundamental convictions, we have the images of the preacher, we have some basic considerations as we prepare, let's talk about a word that you don't hear much about. There's a word, well, you have heard this word. And this, this word is, is quite easy. This word has been tossed around. And I want to share just a basic um, process, if I will, if I can, for biblically exegetical preaching. I still believe that you need your Bible to preach. You need your Bible to preach. I know that there are many streams that you can drink and draw from, but beloved, believe me, when it comes to biblically exegetical preaching, you need your Bible. I need my Bible. We need our Bibles to preach. People come wanting to know, is there a word from the Lord? Let's be responsible and study God's word for our lives, for our living, and for the living of these days and for the people of God. So, I want to just give you, and this comes from Dr. Marvin McMichael's book, Living Water for Thirsty Souls. It is what he calls the 8L's method, the 8L's method for exegesis. Exegesis that word E-X-E-G-E-S-I-S, -E -E -S. it'll be on your handout, it's in your handout, means to draw out, exegeomai, to draw out, to draw from, to draw out. What is this text really tailored to teach us? And you have to understand certain things as you move about in studying this text. First thing, Whenever you're looking at a text, 
First thing you want to ask is what are the natural boundaries of this biblical material? The first L is limits. Limits. What are the limits? Where does the paragraph begin and end? Some call it pericope, but it's paragraph. The narrative or whatever body of, of religious or biblical literature you're looking at. What is the paragraph? What are the limits? And yes, you've got to determine what the limits are going to be when you're looking at a biblical text. You don't want to bite off more than you can chew. Amen. You need to be careful. The narrative must have boundaries. Where does it, where does it begin and end? All right. The second L is literature. What's the genre? We learned this in, the, in, in literature class. Genre is a literary device. What type of literature is this particular passage coming from? What is the genre? What is, what is the literature? Because the Bible is written with various genres in mind. Legal, historical, biographical, poetic, uh, apocalyptic, prophetic, wisdom, parabolic, genealogical information. What kind of literature will you be dealing with? This is very important. Let me just go through this quick, quickly. We know the first five books of the Bible, that's law, Torah, legal. So you understand, yes, those five books will have a lot of legal language in it. All right? The next section in the Hebrew Bible is history. All right? History. That's Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. That's history. That's where we learn of the history of ancient Israel. All right? The next section is poetry. So there's a lot of poetry uh, that we find in the book of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. All right? And then the next section in the Hebrew Bible is prophetic. Prophetic. All right? So you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Those are what they call the major prophets. And then the so-called minor prophets. And I always, I've always had trouble with and struggle with that because I believe any word from God is major. But just for the sake of our conversation, we'll go with what we've been, been told. But please get beyond that. Prophecy is what I really want to reinforce. Prophecy. And so the prophets after Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel is Jose, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Name, Habakkuk, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Those are the prophets. And so the literature of the prophets, it's very important that you understand that literature. And then, of course, we cross over into the Christian portion of our Bible, which is called the New Testament. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what they call the synoptic Gospels because they see, they see the same. Seen, same, optic, optos, optic, see, to see the same, to see a light. The Gospel of John takes a more mystical approach to the gospel or, or the life of Jesus, so it's not considered a synoptic gospel, all right? But they're gospels nonetheless. They speak of the life and teachings of Jesus, all right? So Acts, which was written by Luke, Acts is the history of the church. Acts first, and then you move into the epistles, E-P-I-S-T-L-E-S, -E the, the epistles. And the, the first body of epistles are the Pauline epistles. First and second Corinthians, Romans rather, first and second Corinthians, first and second Thessalonians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, uh, first and second Timothy, Titus, Philemon or Philemon, right? And then you move from the Pauline epistles, not Pauline, Pauline, Pauline epistles into the general epistles, right? Hebrews, James. All right, first and second Peter. These these epistles were written as general statements to general church population. So, in the case of Paul, Paul writes to a specific church in a specific geographical location, and so of course you find you find more of 
what is going on in that particular locale, that particular culture, what's going on in that particular situation. All right? Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude. Those are general epistles. And then the Apocalypse, the Revelation. All of those constitute and represent genres. And you need to make sure, beloved, that you understand the kind of writing you're dealing with. All right? Literature is very, very important. Let me stop a minute and recommend a book for you uh, that I've recently purchased uh, because I think it's important that you have materials that you can look to, especially when you're talking about different books of the Bible. And this resource is Holy Imagination. It's a literary and theological introduction to the whole Bible. Dr. Judy Fentress Williams, who teaches Old Testament at Virginia Theological Seminary in Alexandria, has written a marvelous book that I strongly recommend. And she, she takes into consideration that each of the books of the Bible are conversations that we lean into, that we eavesdrop on to find out what God is saying through individuals to larger and wider communities. I recommend this highly. Holy Imagination, Julie Fentress Williams. Please pick that up, all right? Third, location. Location. The Bible talks about physical locations, and those locations have a dynamic meaning that you and I must be mindful of. So whenever you're studying, where is the activity occurring? What's happening in that space? What is that space known for? And it's important that you know that they, there, it may be a physical location, but it also has a metaphysical meaning. So every physical space has a metaphysical meaning. I won't go into that, but you got to be mindful of that. Whenever the Bible talks about locations, understand that that location has a physical designation, but it also has a metaphysical definition. Fourthly, language. Bible, as we know, was written in various languages, principally Hebrew and Greek. And it's important that we know the language, the language, and the social dynamics out of which the text derives. And then the fifth L. So I've, I've gone through limits. We've gone through literature, location, language, now links. Can the text in question be linked to some other biblical text? or have some relation to another verse of similar construction. It's important to know, does this text have a link to another text? If I had time, I would give that example, but I don't. What, what linkage is there to another text? And can we see that clearly? The sixth L is leads. As in literature, so in the biblical literature. What or who are the antagonists and the protagonists? Who are the major and minor characters? And can their perspectives give direction as to what the meaning of the text is for the original reading or for the reading audience? All right? That's leads. Number seven, what are the lessons? Now, be careful because we're not ready to bring this text into our circumference. We're not ready to bring this into our orbit yet. We're still trafficking in the land of the Bible where it originally occurred. And so the lessons we're trying to gain now are lessons that the original readers, the first audience, what did the hearers understand Jesus to mean when he said, I am the light of the world. You are the light of the world. I am the bread of life. You are the salt of the earth. How have Christians interpreted the word to mean in times different from ours? Now, that's for the New Testament. But when you start talking about the earlier Testament, what did the community first understand 
when this text was first written. I'll give you an example. The first five books of the Bible, Genesis. When Genesis was written, notice this. The people were in Babylonian captivity when the book of Genesis was written or compiled. So, if they're in captivity, there is an agenda that is being put forth for those who are writing and those who are reading. And primarily, the book of Genesis is a book of protest, reminding the people and those who have them in captivity that their history did not begin when they were, when they were snatched from their homeland. That they have a genesis. They have a beginning. And a God who has been with them from their beginning. That their beginning does not start in captivity. Ah, you hear me? Their beginning does not start when they are force fed a diet of inferiority. Where they are made to subject their lives to Babylonian influence. No. They believe in the beginning God or before the beginning God so that they're not sitting relying on the theology of the empire that has enslaved them and captured them and placed them in bondage. They believe that the God who took them out of Egyptian bondage will take them out of Babylonian captivity. See, there's a lesson that the text is tailored to teach for that space. That's the lesson. Finally, the eighth L is life application. So how does this speak to people living 2,000 years removed or thousands of years removed from Babylon? It's difficult and it's dangerous for people to take ancient texts and make them fit into our agenda, our present life setting, our present sense of labor. Be careful that you don't do that. Don't do that. That is not a wise place. That is not a place that is healthy for the people of God. What is the life application? What can God be saying to us when we hear the text and hear the words of Scripture? What is God saying to us? What is God saying to you to say to those who will listen in the 21st century? How do we take the text from Scripture and apply them to where we are all around the world? All right? Now, we're wrapping up. But also, but after you have done the exegetical work, after you've done the exegetical work, now, you must now begin constructing an outline. How, how should the outline work? All right? Now, for this, I lean heavily on uh, three important texts. Now, there are other texts, but these are the texts that I lean on. So, we have The Certain Sound of the Trumpet by Dr. Samuel B. Witt Proctor, Crafting a Sermon of Authority. This is a very powerful book, and I use this book not only... Uh, for my own preaching and preparation, but I also use it to teach my students. The Witness of Preaching, which is, for many, the standard introductory preaching textbook on the market today by Thomas Long, who is Bandy Professor Emeritus of Preaching at Candler School of Theology in the University. And this workbook, which is companion to a very powerful piece, Dr. Frank Thomas, who wrote the book, They Never Like to Quit Praising God, The Role of Celebration in Preaching. This is a preaching workbook. I suggest it, I strongly suggest it, as you parse out and look at processes for preparing your sermons, preparing your messages. Now, talking about the anatomy or the outline of the homiletical presentation, you begin first with the subject. Or as we were taught in seminary, the idea, the idea, the what of the sermon. And here I, I would strongly caution you not to pick a subject or title that 
monopolizes both intent and integrity. The, the, the title comes from the subject. Subject comes from the idea, the what of the sermon. Once you have that in view, it helps to form the proposition which reflects your strivings and stirrings. What has this sermon been doing with you and to you? How has this sermon been moving you? What in this sermon has touched the very nerve center of your spiritual life? The proposition is also a positive affirmative statement. It's the good news. It's the proclamation of what God wills to do in any situation or event. It, it is asking a fundamental or declaring a fundamental fact or truth about what God is up to and what God is doing in the world. and How God has chosen to reveal God's self in the life and witness of people with whom God is striving with and how that same God is also striving with us. That's the proposition. It comes again from the idea and the subject. The subject and the idea. The what of the serpent. Then, of course, we move to the text. We've identified a text. The text is that which we have chosen to base the argument on. It's the textual basis. It's the biblical foundation for preaching. What is that text that has been chosen for proclamation? And then, once the text is identified, then we begin talking about the introduction. And in the introduction, there is what is called, I believe, or what is called the antithesis. What condition is this sermon addressing? What error in thinking? What condition that must be altered? What mood that must be dispelled? What direction that must be reversed? What ignorance that needs to be illumined? What lethargy that needs to be replaced? What is the condition that the sermon addresses. It's important that the sermon addresses a condition or situation. That we live in a world that is fallen in nature and that fallenness is manifested in our behavior although we are saints. We are saints to use the words of Bishop Richard L. Fisher of blessed memory, we are saints with sinners' problems. And the Bible is not written merely for saints, it's written for saints with sinners' problems. And it's not a wide book. Dr. Gardner Taylor of blessed memory taught us that. It's a, by, it's a how book. It doesn't always tell us why. You get very few why answers or why questions answered. It does show us how. And it speaks to conditions. Conditions of the human heart. Conditions of the human spirit. Conditions of society. Conditions of community. The problems that people face. It's important for the introduction. But then... The, the, the introduction gives way to the thesis and the proposition presented is juxtaposed to the antithesis. In other words, this is the direction in which the sermon, the message of the morning is headed. The thesis is God's answer to the antithesis. The antithesis may raise a need, but the thesis will answer it. That yes, we live in a world with devil's fear. But there's an answer to the problems that we face. There's an answer to the ills that we see. There's an answer 
to the social crisis and the social problems. There's an answer to the way, yes, we think and behave and believe. And the person who comes to our pews, the person who darkens our doors to hear, Ko Adno Adonai, what thus saith the Lord, when they come, they want to know, is there a word? And we must offer it to them. God does speak to their issues. And when they come in, they must be prepared. We must be prepared to issue a challenge that speaks to their issues and concerns. All right? There's a relevant question. Now, Dr. Proctor raises this as, as important as we move from the condition the sermon addresses, the proposition that's presented as a juxtaposition to the antithesis, God's answer to the problem, the next thing you want to deal with, because people are coming in with their issues, they're coming in with their concerns, they're coming in with their heartaches, which we're showing them that God has an answer for it. They're going, to, they're going to ask the question, so what do I do with it? So what? Where do I go from here? Does this break into relevant application for my life, my family, my community, my country, my world, the church, the Christian community, the whole human family? Relevant question is now, what am I to do with this? How am I to deal with this? I have time, I'll give you some examples of what a relevant question might be. That if God is speaking to a timeless yet timely issue, if a timeless God is speaking to a very timely issue, such as racism, or injustice. And God's word explicitly speaks in opposition or juxtaposition to that issue. The next question that is going to be raised is, so what do I do with it? And where do I go from here? That, my friends, is the relevant question. And if you're declaring that Jesus' resurrection upends the machinations of empire and the evil that has been propagated and promulgated against the human spectrum and the social location. The next question is, how does that resurrection then speak to my life and how do I employ the power of that resurrection? If I'm speaking to the issue of faith and the struggle or the antithesis is doubt and fear, how we operate in a place of fear and anxiety and frustration. And yet, this God who has revealed Godself in Jesus Christ reminds us that faith is not merely a noun. Faith is a verb. It's, it's, it's that which I become. How do I embrace that faith? How is that faith manifested? How do I employ those principles in my life when everything I've tried has failed? Relevant question. And then finally, not finally, got a couple more, and then I'll be done. There is the synthesis. Some would call the synthesis the points. And for many, it's three points. For some, it's two points. Someone asked the question, how many points should a sermon have? Well, to be faithful to preaching, you must have at least one point. One point. One point, I think, is vitally important. But for many, it's three, it's possibly two, four. But the synthesis, that is the answer, really, to the relevant question. It brings everything to bear upon what is needed and necessary to move from where I am to where God wants me to be. That's the body of the sermon. It's the answer to the relevant question. 
You see the building blocks? You see the building blocks? You have subject, idea, that's the word of the sermon. The proposition of the sermon, which reflects the preacher's spiritual journey and the congregation's spiritual life. It's an affirmative statement what God is doing. The text, the introduction then exposes us to the antithesis, the conditions, how God speaks to those conditions through the seat, through the thesis. And then the relevant question, how does this work? So what do I do? How do I move? How does this apply? How do I make connection? The synthesis answers that. But then finally, there must be the charisma, or what Miles Jones of Blessed Memory calls the charismatic conclusion. How does this empty into or issue forth? through what we believe is the gospel. What then makes this preachment gospel worthy? Worthy of the gospel. As seen through life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. It's important. Now, hear me. I'm not saying that every time you get up, you got to close down with, he died. And for my African brothers, yes, that rhythm, that cadence is not just merely an African-American construct. It, 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 it resonates from our guttural impulses where we enter into that ecstasy moment where God speaks to us and, and takes hold of our being. and We move in the rhythm and cadence of of what God is saying and what God is speaking. But beyond that, I'm saying, what does the gospel say? And how does this issue forth in the gospel of Jesus Christ? And how does Jesus invite us to take share and to take our place in this pregnant moment that has been given to us? And how do we draw people into that embrace? How do we draw people into the embrace and under the influence of the gospel? Preaching without gospel is merely sociological or philosophical commentary. There must be gospel at the heart of our preaching. How is God making all this occur through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit through the life and witness of the church. How is this made clear for us as we move forward as the people of God? That's your truck. That's your, that's your challenge. That's what God entrusts us with. God help us if we merely give people our opinions and never issue it into the life and teachings of Jesus. As you preach, please be mindful that you and I must function under a high integrity, a high reverence for preaching, a high reverence for scripture. This can be the finest hour for the church. This can be the finest hour for the, for the preaching of the gospel. If we will preach the gospel, as the hymn writer says, simple, full, and free. I believe that we've been entrusted with that sacred task. I want to thank you for joining us for for this sharing today, and I pray that it has been a blessing to you. I hope that uh, you will get some major mileage out of the handout that will be yours. If you want to reach out to us, our information will be made available to you. I'd love to have more conversation with you. Just simply remember, you've been called to this preaching ministry 
but you've also been called to a life that is open for God to do some amazing things. And I hope and pray that you will allow God to do that. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time you've given to us to share, to reflect, to ponder what it means, O oh Lord, to be your ambassadors, to be your communicators, to be your voice of the world. God, may we be swift to hear your voice. May we be swift to hear your call on our lives, to embrace it, O oh God, in such a way that we will be changed and that we will be the change that is necessary to bring about change for the church as well as change for the world. Bless our bishop and missionary supervisors and we pray that you will continue to bless every preacher that will hear this sharing. May we all be swept up into a new and exciting odyssey where we are and we become dispensers of your grace and your mercy as we have received it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. Thank you again for joining me. Peace and blessings.